Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled, Do Not Yell at My Second Officer. You are done as an instructor. Uh, this presentation will give you a little uh, behind the scenes, behind the cockpit door, view of how things at least worked for me at my airline on uh, training and checking. All right, so let me give you a little bit of background of the situation uh, at United Airlines when I got hired. Things were moving pretty rapidly. Of course, we were moving into recession, and that's when I was furloughed for four and a half years. But things were moving very rapidly when I got hired. And they told me we're hiring 500 a year for the next five years, and you'll be a co-pilot in two and a half years. Well, two and a half years came, and I still had another three years of furlough to go. Um, and when I got back, they said, oh, you're going to be a co-pilot in two, and a half, two years, two and a half years. And I said, oh, I can't stand another four and a half years of furlough. Please don't say that. But anyway, things had been stagnant, okay? So um, the people who had been second officers had been second officers typically anywhere from 11 to 17 years. And they knew the job. Well, they're moving up into the co-pilot seat now, and I'm a brand new second officer. And we'd go up to our initial uh, cruising altitude of 29,000 or something. And then the captain would turn to me and say, are we good for 35? Uh, you know, have we burned off enough fuel to go up in altitude? And I'd say, well, let me check. And of course, the co-pilot would kind of smile and lean over and says, we're good for it. You know, well, of course he knew. And I'd, I'd kid him. I said, hey, that's my job. That's my job. And then I'd lean forward. I'd check it and say, we're good for it. And we'd kind of laugh about that. But these guys know what they're doing. I was one of the new guys. And uh, from then on, um, after I came back from the furlough, we had some pretty good movement. So, um, uh, came back and in the late 80s um, I was a second officer on the uh, on the 727 by um, the early 90s I was a captain on the 727 okay so that's a little background so we've got a lot of movement a lot of new people coming and going well I'm uh, in the co-pilot seat now I moved up from second officer and there was a crusty old captain named Jim he was uh, he was a good guy but um, he would kind of ride you and if, if uh, you know you didn't know your stuff he was kind of on top of you and uh, it could get a little bit oppressive at times but anyway I'm the co-pilot and uh, we've got a second officer back there and we start hearing in the the headphones kind of a, a funny uh, sound. You know, you always get that 400 hertz cycle because that's what the uh, the frequency things uh, operate at, the generators and that. And they do it to keep the transformers small. That's why the higher frequency instead of 60 cycles. Now, I'm an electrical engineer, so I knew um, kind of a little more things about the electrical panel than probably most people did. But um, we're hearing this noise, and we look back at the panel. Okay. The uh, green arrow goes to the uh, kilowatt, and you press the button and give you KVARS, kilovolts, uh, kilovolts reactive. Um, okay, I'm not going to go into that, but basically uh, we saw the uh, KW needles kind of moving around a little bit. They'd be going up and down and uh, all over the place. One would go up, the other one would go down. And we thought, hmm, we've got a little issue with one of the generators, most likely. One of the generators is, is not happy. So, uh, Captain says, well, let's, let's isolate the tie buses. Okay, you look at the yellow arrow there. Um, that is what ties all the buses together. You, uh, you synchronize the uh, generators. This is what the second officer does. It's all done automatically now, uh, if, if done at all. Sometimes they keep buses isolated, depending on the aircraft. But anyway, he said, uh, let's strip a bus tie and, uh, and see uh, if, if it goes away. And the second officer looked like kind of a deer in the headlights. And the captain said, okay, there's me with the yellow arrow. And he says, and, and, and the green arrow is the uh, generator panel there. He says, uh, he, he asked her a couple times to trip the bus tie and just no response. So he finally says to me, he says, do you know what I'm talking about? And I go, yeah. And he says, do it. So I turn around. So you see where my seat is as, as the uh, co-pilot there? I turn around and I trip the number three bus tie. Okay. Uh, you can see the number three generator is not happy. Everybody calms down. So he realizes he says, okay, take, uh, take the number three generator offline and, and, and bring that bus back on still deer in the headlights. I know th there wasn't a checklist for that. You can't really blame her. Um, there wasn't a checklist. Uh, it, it took kind of a, you know, a bit of an understanding of the system, not a whole bunch, but, um, so I sat there, I, he says, you do it. So I did it, put it back. And then, uh, he and I went out uh, for dinner. It was Sacramento. I remember, and we're sitting there, uh, eating, having a couple of beers. She didn't want to join us. And, uh, I just looked up at him and said, uh, I didn't think I could operate the uh, generator panel from the, uh, co-pilot seat. And he looked at me and he just shook his head and he says, yeah. 
Okay, later on, I'm a Czech airman on the 727. I've got enough experience as captain that they asked me to be a Czech airman. So I said, okay, now here's the badge. See, I'm a Czech airman. The, the funny thing about this is uh, this is after, well, after 9-11. This is actually my 777 uh, Czech airman badge. But, uh, you know, with all the security that was enhanced after that, obviously, um, they decided we want to put this on because I would give a... You know, if I was evaluating somebody to be an instructor, uh, I would show up in civilian clothes because there's nothing worse than having two captains on the uh, the flight deck and, uh, you know, somebody comes up and they wonder, well, who's the real captain? So I didn't want to confuse it, so I wear civilian clothes. So they, they put this on there. It was nice. But now, back to the story. All right. I, I've got this, uh, this second officer, and he's operating as my second officer, but he's also a uh, uh, line check airman. He can give training to second officers only. He's not uh, in a pilot seat, so he's not qualified to do that, but, but he gives training to second officers. Okay, we're uh, cruising on to Albany that night, I remember. We took off out of O'Hare, and we're cruising on to Albany. And uh, the flight attendant uh, comes up, and she says, uh, do you guys want any drinks, you know, coffee, stuff like that? Oh, it was kind of funny. Just as she came up, this little yellow light on number three engine comes on. And uh, if you heard some of my other stories about my engine failures, uh, three of them, always number three engine. Uh, I don't know what it's about number three engine, but I was glad I got in the triple seven. I got rid of that number three engine. But anyway, this little light comes on and she goes, uh, is that all right? And I say, no, we need to handle that. And I'm pulling the power back on the, on the number three engine. He says, um, I think I'll go out for now. <laughs> so she, she leaves, uh, she leaves the cockpit and I said, okay, let's get out the checklist. So we get out the checklist. Of course, he's got it back there in the second officer position and it's low oil pressure or filter bypass light. Well, we don't have low oil pressure. We just have the filter bypass light. And what, what this means is that there could be a problem with the engine. It could be shedding parts and there's a little filter there. And if the filter gets clogged for some reason, the oil bypasses it. Well, the, the bad reason you don't want it to get clogged is that pieces of the engine are uh, coming off, you know, bearings are coming apart and they're clogging the oil system. So what you do, uh, you go through the little checklist here on the right. And is oil pressure below 35 PSI? Well, it's also a low pressure light, so that's telling you you got a problem. And that's a no. So you go there, reduce thrust on associated engine. Well, I'd already do, did that because I, I knew what, what, you know, what was coming on this. And then did low oil pressure or uh, filter bypass light uh, go off? It did not. So you come up here and he's reading me the checklist. I don't have the checklist in front of me because he has it. And it says accomplish in-flight engine shutdown. And he reads that. And I go, no, I don't think so. I, I think that is an option, but we don't have to do that. And uh, I think there's more to it. And he goes, no, it says accomplish in-flight engine shutdown. I said, let, let me see the book here. And it says, or reduce thrust to minimum required to sustain flight. Well, I could have it at idle if, you know, I, I keep that engine running. It gives me a generator. It gives me pneumatics. It gives me, uh, you know, hydraulic pumps, things like that. Anything, anything I would necessarily need off of that engine. So um, might as well keep it running. Okay. So we head on back. We get a new airplane. Um, I make an announcement to the people about, you know, we had to return. And, um, you know, it's no issue because it's really not significant. But I had one passenger come up. Uh, we we deplaned everybody, got another airplane plane, and we headed on to Albany later that night. I had another uh, passenger say, well, was that more serious than you let on to us because of all the fire trucks? And I said, well, that's just a precautionary thing. But uh, I don't like to upset people. It's not necessary. And it wasn't in this case. And uh, I hope you I hope you enjoy the uh, the color of this 27. I'm I'm so glad nobody ever wanted this color. This is the uh, Boeing prototype uh, paint job, and uh, no no we don't want this airplane this color. So but anyway we're on another flight. Same second officer is the guy who um, kind of muffed up the checklist and didn't impress me very much. And this guy is a a, a Czech airman on it supposed to train people. Now we got another issue. We're coming up into Chicago and we're at about uh, 33,000 feet, somewhere in that range. And all of a sudden the altitude warning horn goes off. 
And he's there, he's got his head down, he's, uh, he's reading something, and uh, I turn around, and I see the cabin altitude, which is to the, uh, um, the left of the arrow there, um, all the way on this picture, and it's coming up, it's above 10,000 feet, that's why the horn's going off, and I can see that the, uh, the cabin altitude is not climbing at a rate that we would have noticed, but it never um, did the uh, it it never reached what should have been a normal uh, cabin altitude of around eight thousand feet or so. Um, we had an issue, and I told him to silence the horn. And he goes, "What?" I said, "Silence the horn, the horn button. Silence it." And he fumbles around a little bit to, to find it, and. Uh, we don't want this. We don't want the plastic jungle in back because if the cabin altitude hits 14,000 feet, these things automatically deploy. So, okay, we need to get working the problem here. First of all, get rid of the horn because it's noisy. All right, here's the pressurization panel. It's right below uh, the horn cutoff button there, and it's the, uh, it's the newer one, the fancy one. And this is some of the aspects about it, the various uh, uh, malfunction lights, like an auto fail light. And you got the, uh, you know, you set the cabin altitude. It does everything automatically. You, you set the landing altitude and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a real nice system and it does everything fine. It gets you a few warning lights. Well, um, we didn't have any warning lights on this, which is kind of interesting. But I said, go to the pressurization auto fail light on, okay? Because that, that's a checklist that takes us through the steps. And what you basically do is the system normally operates in auto, okay? Well, if that's not working, then you go to standby. And standby gives you a little more basic control where you can set the cabin altitude. Well, that's not working, and the cabin altitude is continuing to climb. So I said, okay, go to manual AC or DC, try either one. And I had to talk this guy through more of this than I really should have. I said, try manual AC first, try to close the valve. That uh, the selector knob there in the green is, is takes you through the various functions and the yellow there, that shows you the outflow valve. And that's what uh, um, controls the pressurization basically in the aircraft in the cabin altitude. So I tell him to close it with the AC. That valve is not moving. I said, go to DC. I mean, that's our, that's our most, back, most basic backup situation we have is manual DC. And I said, use that, try to close it. It's not moving. So I said, okay, uh, we need to get down. So basically, we went through um, the rapid pressurization. It wasn't, but the cabin was, uh, we needed to do an emergency descent. And the funny thing was, I had a deadhead captain uh, back in there. And uh, we start to go through the steps. We put the oxygen mask on ourselves. Um, I got clearance to, uh, to go down. We uh, started the speed brakes. Now, the 27 is a fast airplane. And it can go down quite rapidly. And, and I made a, a it was over 10,000 feet per minute down. And I've got the speed brakes up. And we're, we're going up to the, um, you know, uh, VMO, MMO, the limiting uh, airspeed or Mach indicator on it, otherwise known as the barber pole. But uh, it was funny. I, I talked to the captain afterwards because uh, I never really needed to say anything to the people. Um, I talked to him afterwards and he thought that maybe I was a commuter and just in a hurry. He didn't realize that we'd actually done an emergency descent. And the funny thing was, we get down to uh, uh, 10,000 feet uh, so I could keep the speed up. And I look back at the fuel panel to see how much fuel we had. Uh, if we had enough to continue the flight into O'Hare, we were down by uh, Fort Wayne. And I looked up and we had 33,000 pounds of gas on because gas was expensive at O'Hare. So we were uh, doing what was known as ferrying fuel in. If we had enough uh, weight margin that it wasn't going to be a problem, we, we carried fuel in so we didn't have to pay um, the expensive taxes and price in uh, Chicago O'Hare. And so we, we ferried the fuel in. Well, fortunately, we avoided this. We didn't want to do that. But here's an outflow valve. Now, this uh, actually isn't off the uh, 27, but um, it's, it's a similar operation. This is just a valve that opens and closes, and this valve had failed. Um, the, uh, it had stuck, and uh, both motors uh, were deceased, uh, so there was no way we were going to get pressurization back. And we, we came back at, at 10,000 feet with a cabin altitude basically at 10,000 feet. 
Okay. Again, I'm not too impressed with this second officer, and I have a little talk with him and stuff like that, and I said, you know, if we have another problem, uh, I'm going to send you back to training because uh, y- you need to know your systems, especially some of the emergency features, better. And if you're going to be a guy who's training, y- you need to know what you're doing. Okay, well, this is where everything came to a head. I've got a second officer who's in training, and this uh, pilot again, the one who've had I've had issues with, um, was the instructor checking him out. Now the gentleman sitting back at the pa- at the panel was a uh, retired military. Um, he was probably even a little bit older than me, but he's back there at the panel. He's a good guy. I mean, very experienced, uh, super super intelligent guy. But uh, this instructor. Uh, is is actually yelling at him. He's raising his voice and he's yelling at him. And I turn around and I, I, I said to him, I says, okay, you need to respect the individual. You do not yell at him. I said, I've had it with you. You are done as an instructor. I said, um, we get down, we'll land, and, and you are done. I had just had it with him. And I... Um, I'd done a lot of work. I, I had a good uh, reputation. It, it, it wouldn't really matter too much anyway. I was a line check airman. I was a captain, so that's sufficient. And uh, I got this guy pulled off his of status. So uh, after we got back in, um, I uh, uh, needed to have a qualified second officer sent back, or at least a check airman. I forget which one I did, because uh, we were down in the uh, Miami area. Uh, we went in, had flown into Miami, so I got I got another guy. They had no trouble getting somebody down, and I sent this guy back to Deadhead. And of course, I went and and talked to uh, the appropriate people in charge, and he was pulled off status and actually uh, sent back for training. So I was a real pain in the posterior for this guy. Don't really know whatever happened to him, but um, he uh, wasn't going to be an instructor any uh, on the twenty seven anymore, and I doubt if he ever got into an instruction position after that. And there's my last flight out of Maui, the water cannon salute, got a little rainbow there, and uh, ended my career after 25 years as captain. Uh, never killed anybody, never been an airplane, and uh, had, a, had a great time. So, thanks for watching. I hope you found it informative and enjoyable.